Hey everyone, today's message uh, picks up the story of Moses after he led the children of Israel through the Red Sea on dry land, um, out of the grasp of the Egyptians who were giving chase. God rescued them. That's what we looked about last week. And now we're going to kind of follow up on that to see how God's presence, how God's leadership in Moses's life developed. Okay, so we're going to look today at uh, Exodus 32 and 33. Now then, the first thing that uh, we need to understand about God's presence is that it's desperately needed because we're sinful people and we live among sinful people. Oh, the Lord had been so good to God's children there in, in Israel. They, uh, they were rescued. Israel was rescued out of Egypt, uh, literally saved from slavery. And it was a great day. And of course, uh, as soon as they got on the other side of the Red Sea, oh, the complaining started. And Moses, uh, I'm sure, was thinking, what have I got myself into? Uh, the people themselves had thought, what have we got ourselves into? And yet they depended on that presence of God, a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. And then God, in Exodus chapter 20, uh, shared the Ten Commandments with the people and then called Moses up onto the mountain, and for 40 days and 40 nights, Moses was there in the presence of God on the mountain. We're used to God's presence being everywhere and anywhere in today's world, and certainly Jesus said in the Great Commission uh, to go ye into all the world and make disciples, and he said, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. The Holy Spirit is sent to us was sent into the world at Pentecost to be that comforter. Uh, we are called the temple, the dwelling place of God over in the book of 1 Corinthians. And so as Christians on this side of the cross, we're very much used to God's presence being everywhere. But in the days of Moses, God's presence came and went. It was uh, isolated to a certain location. And so Moses had to ask for and beseech the Lord to remain with him and with his people. And uh, certainly the presence of God was needed in that day because of the sinfulness of the people. Here's what happened. When Moses approached the camp and saw this golden calf and, and all that dancing, his anger burned and he threw his tablets down out of his hands, breaking them into pieces at the foot of the mountain. There was this angry outburst and Moses certainly had every right there's righteous anger i can't believe these people i'm gone for a couple weeks and i come back and aaron has allowed all this to happen that they're they're worshiping other gods the god that rescued them is now being abandoned and moses is headed up to here i can imagine that from time to time you've had periods uh, when you were beside yourself with anger maybe in this case with moses it was righteous anger uh, with many of us, however, we experience times when it's just old-fashioned selfish anger. We don't get our way. It's not the Lord's way we're looking after, but our way. And I've experienced that, and I need God's presence to moderate me and to lead me through seasons of anger. And then Moses took vengeance upon the people. I don't completely understand all that this verse uh, means, but it, it just seems like Moses is just going over the top and punishing God's people. And he took the calf that the people had made and he burned it in the fire and then he ground it into powder and he scattered it on the water and made the Israelites drink it. Uh, God just needs to help us to be merciful and to uh, to moderate some of that anger. I think Moses just kind of went over the, the top here. Then the blaming. Aaron picks up the story now. He said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? And it was Aaron's job to be the leader while Moses was gone. But he says, don't be angry, my Lord. Aaron answered, you know how prone these people are to evil. Moses knew that. Moses had been with them and heard their complaining. That's why he left Aaron in charge. And Aaron literally let the ball drop. And uh, Aaron, of course, this is um, nothing new. Uh, 
Eve blamed it on the snake. Adam blamed it on Eve. Oh, it was just a season of blame then. And even today, we blame so many things on the evil that surround us. And we do live in an evil world. But we must take individual responsibility for what we've done. And Aaron is failing to do, to do that here. Then all this disrespect. They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. Well, that's a slap in the face to God, isn't it? Hey, God, the one who rescued me out of Israel, the one that led me through the Red Sea, uh, I'm just going to move on and go with other gods now. Oh, what a terrible moment of disrespect this is. And as for this fellow Moses, what kind of description is that? This fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't even know what's happened to him. How quickly they forgot. How quickly we forget all the good things that our leaders and our Lord does for us. And so they showed great disrespect. This is the reason we need God's presence in our lives because of our sin and the sin of those around us. And then they descended into idolatry. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. And they gave me the gold and I threw it into the fire and out came this golden calf. I think the sad part of this uh, verse here is, you know, that jewelry came from the Egyptians. God had impressed upon the Egyptians to give the Israelites all their gold and silver. And it was, its intended use was to decorate and to furnish the tabernacle that they would be building for the Lord. And yet it's, it's wasted here on idolatry. I don't know how often we waste what was meant for God on other things. But here's why we need God's presence to keep us from the pit of idolatry. So how do we, how do we gain the presence of God? How do we do that? Uh, I've asked uh, my friend Matt uh, to give us a short little impression video on uh, how we might gain the presence of, of God or more clearly what that might look like in our lives. So let's uh, have Matt take the stage for just a moment. If you were to see God up close and personal, how would your life change? And I think we all, to some level or another, have this idea of God that he's way out there and in some far corner of the universe, unconcerned with us and, and what we're doing. And yet the Bible clearly teaches that God is very active and very involved in his creation. I'm reminded of the story of Paul when he was speaking before the people of Athens at Mars Hill. And uh, as he had been walking through their city, he saw an altar that was made to an unknown God. Yeah. And so it is, I think, that there's this little part inside each one of us that hopes that God is, is somewhere out there we just don't know who he is or where he is and uh, but we do want to have that connection and that relationship with him and paul realized this and he encouraged him he said that they should seek after god and perhaps steal their way toward him and find him and then he added this statement he said though he is not actually far from each one of us though he is not actually far from each one of us and i remember when i was first learning uh, to drive I was trying to get the timing down of when to change lanes in traffic, and there were times that I thought I had enough room to get in the other lane, but then I would see those those little words in the side mirror. And what do they say? They say, objects in the mirror may be closer than they appear. And, uh, and so it is, I think, that, that with God, he is actually uh, quite close to each one of us, that we can you know, know it or feel that way. And uh, how should that actually and actively uh, change our lives? Well, I think it's important to look at the disciples' lives, right? After all, if anyone knew God up close and personal, it was these uh, people who had followed Jesus during his earthly ministry. And so you have people uh, such as Peter or James and John who went from being uh, fishermen uh, to being great evangelists and great leaders within the church. Uh, Matthew went from being a, a corrupt tax collector to being a person who wrote one of the first Gospels, or Mary Magdalene who went from being demon-possessed to being uh, the first person to see Jesus 
after his resurrection. And I think that seeing Jesus had such a dramatic impact on these people's lives that really reoriented them uh, in such a way that they were completely devoted to him and to his cause. And so I think it is today that if we were really truly to see God in a close and personal way, that the distractions, the discouragements that we have in our lives, that those would fade away, and that all that would remain would be a, a determination to follow him and to serve him in any way that we can. Hey, thanks a lot, Matt. I appreciate those words of encouragement. How did Moses go about experiencing the presence of God? Now, remember, on this side of the cross, we invite Jesus into our heart. He, he lives within us. His spirit guides us. And so uh, Moses, on the other hand, he needed to inquire of God, please, please remain with us. So we have it much easier. But we can still learn from Moses' example here. He listened and responded to God. Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me, lead these people. And he's responded to that. Moses has proven himself as a trustworthy follower. And that's how you gain the presence of the Lord more and more into your life. And then you find favor with God by becoming teachable. And Moses certainly was. You know, he uh, began leading God's people in his 80s. Uh, you might think, oh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. But Moses knew that he was ill-equipped. He knew that he needed the presence and the leadership of God to be successful. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. And then in verse 13, if you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Moses had this idea that he hadn't learned it all already. That there was still much more for him to learn. And on this side of the cross, we think of Moses as this like this big example of someone who got it right. But in the day, he knew that he needed to learn so, so very much more. And when we have that attitude of being teachable, the Lord's presence will seem more and more real to us. And then to cling to the promises of God. In Exodus 13, remember that this nation is your people, your people. And absolutely, God had promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and to Joseph and the 12 tribes of Israel, and now to Moses and Aaron. And Moses is just clinging to that promise, and that was ushering in the fullness of God's presence in his life. Well, once we have God's presence, once we fellowship with him, once we're near to him, he's near to us, what do we gain from that? Rest. Oh, man, can you imagine leading this scrawny group of two million people? Hebrews, some scholars put the number that high, uh, that would be pretty exhausting. That would be difficult. And the Lord replied, my presence will go with you. They're about to strike out for the promised land. They're about to pick up camp and to move forward. And I will give you rest. I don't know how exhausted you are, but uh, I've read studies and seen reports that the entirety of our nation is we're tired of COVID, tired of inflation, tired of political discord, tired of this, tired of that. We just, we need some rest. And the rest comes in the presence of the Lord. Confidence. Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. I mean, Moses is just saying, Lord, I can't do this without, without you. You're in charge here. You're the boss. And uh, his confidence, even during those times back in, with Pharaoh, of the plagues and leading across the Red Sea and in the wilderness, all that confidence came from the presence of God. Lord, if you're not going, I'm not going either. Then validation. Uh, we all have self-doubt. We all wonder if we're headed the right direction. Will people respect us? Will they acknowledge that we are Christ followers. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? 
And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked because I'm pleased with you. And I know you by name. They had a tight relationship. Moses was continually in contact with the Lord and in his presence. And that validated Moses's leadership and Moses's mission. And we need that even today. And then God's glory and his goodness and mercy and compassion and all these things come from being in his presence. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. And I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. He was saying to Moses, I will be merciful to you, Moses, when we're together. Compassion with you, Moses, when we're together. Goodness with you, my glory will shine on you, Moses, when we're together. And that comes from being in the presence of God Almighty. And finally, God will give you all you can handle. You know, uh, it's, it's a great adventure to follow Jesus. And he gives us all we can handle along the way. Uh, never too much. He doesn't tip us over the edge. He wants us to walk forward in faith, trusting that together we can make it. But uh, the cup is full, my friends. But he said, you cannot see my face. For no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. And when my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Oh, there is a great difference between us on and the Lord. He is God Almighty of the universe. He will give us all we can handle, but not an ounce more. And so that was with Moses in seeing his face. Here's a question to consider today as we wrap up today's message. What can I do this week to rest in the presence of God? I know you're busy. I know you're exhausted. I know that life can sometimes be hard. But what is it that you might be able to do this week to rest in the presence of God? Hey, here's the closing prayer. Really simple this week. Not, not much theology here. Just this reckless abandon of wanting to be with God, to see him and to serve him. The closing prayer reads like this. I'll read it first and then we'll bow our heads together. Dear God, more of you is our prayer today. Much more in Jesus name. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Dear God, more of you is our prayer today. Much more. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. And thank you so much for your attention today and I hope you have a great weekend and I just hope that the Lord blesses you richly.